Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the lineup. Today is April the 4th, 2024. I'm Barry Stagner. Very glad to have you joining with us. And as promised last week, I've got a guest here in the studio with me uh, who just had a, a birthday, and uh, he's down here under my desk. Come here, bub. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Come on. Up here. There he is. Hello, everyone. <laughs> And this boy's two years old now, and uh, as I often tease, he's the most famous dog in the world. People know him uh, all over the globe and say hi to him and send me emails and messages to say hello to Louis. But uh, anyway, just um, I know there's a lot of Louis fans out there, so wanted to make sure you got uh, got a chance to see him. Um, we've got a, a program lined up for you today that's kind of a follow-up in some parts to what we talked about last week and how, uh, you know, the thinking in the world today is just so bizarre and so many strange things that are, are being uh, forced upon us and, and uh, decisions being made at high levels that just don't make any sense at all. And a couple of things before we jump into our stories. Uh, first of all, I would uh, covet and appreciate your prayers. And, you know, somebody told me thou shalt not covet. Well, covet's only bad when you covet for wrong things. Uh, covet means simply to desire or to uh, hope for, and I do hope for your prayers. Uh, this weekend, actually tomorrow morning, uh, 6.45, I think, I'll be flying to uh, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, the pastor, Mike Spaulding of Calvary Chapel, and I've told it's pronounced Lima, uh, will be picking me up and we'll be having an all-day conference on Saturday at uh, Calvary Lima. And then that evening, uh, Pastor Joe Bruch is going to pick me up and drive me the three hours over to Portsmouth, Ohio. And uh, I'll be teaching there on Sunday morning. And I believe the Lima conference is sold out. <clears throat> but if you're in the Portsmouth area, I'm sure uh, you'd be more than welcome to join us uh, for church. Uh, the Saturday event is a prophecy conference. And the uh, Sunday, I'll be teaching a message on Bible prophecy as well there at the church in Portsmouth. So again, I would appreciate your prayers for that. And then next uh, weekend, uh, the following week, I will be uh, doing the lineup on Thursday, but then uh, after uh, uh, after the uh, lineup, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, we'll be headed over to Prescott, Arizona. And uh, for a uh, conference on Saturday, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we'll be leaving Friday for the conference on Saturday. And uh, so we'll be at uh, the... It's a middle school, and I think there's still room uh, to sign up if you'd like to come and join us there. So that's uh, Saturday, April 13th in uh, Prescott, Arizona, uh, for a prophecy conference. Uh, I think um, uh, David Guzik, a great Bible teacher, uh, is going to be there uh, as well. And I can't remember who the other speakers are. Oh, duh, uh, Michael Lay um, uh, from Behold Israel Ministries will be there. And uh, it's just going to be a great day. So please be praying for these events. And, and most of all, you know, when people come to these things, uh, you know, they want to invite friends and there's prophecy critics and and all that other stuff uh, that, that happens at, at these events. And and there's some folks that are stretching prophecy into things that it, it doesn't necessarily mean and uh, who want to enlighten the speakers uh, as to what's going on. So, you know, they're really wonderful events. And uh, challenging at times, but, uh, you know, I think the most important thing is that it reminds us of the lateness of the hour, which is always an opportunity to present the gospel. And we do it every conference and uh, just uh, be praying for that. We, I know lots of churches saw uh, just loads of people dedicate their lives to Christ. Everybody's wondering what in the world is going on uh, with our world. What, why have things turned just so bizarre and crazy? And uh, people are wanting answers. And we, as the people of God, are the people with the answers. So uh, we'll be uh, sharing uh, truth and all those things that uh, are so critical to the days in which we live. They give us clarity of thought. And, and the conciseness of Bible prophecy reminds us that this book is unlike any other. And therefore, uh, we can trust in the gospel content portion uh, of the Bible as well. Well, obviously, I think all of us, our hearts are going out to those in Taiwan. And the Independent reported that the Taiwan earthquake latest death toll has risen to 10, uh, nine yesterday, 
and there have been over 300 terrifying aftershocks. And, you know, uh, watching some of the, the websites that I do, looking at these uh, lists of earthquake events around the world, uh, in Taiwan, it's 5758, 5658, 575. I mean, just, you know, li- uh, row on, almost one right on top of the other. And, you know, that's that's a significant shaking as well. And can you imagine, um, you know, exactly what this article said, how terrifying it would be after you just saw a 7-4 uh, that killed 10 people. And then you've got these, these massive, uh, seemingly back-to-back, uh, follow-up aftershocks, and a thousand people were injured in the biggest earthquake recorded on the island in 25 years, and more than 40 people are remaining uh, trapped as far as this morning. Uh, and uh, Trevor's uh, tremors set off at least nine landslides, debi- debris, collapsed hill slides onto a, a major highway, uh, which runs down the east coast, and 300 aftershocks, as the headline read, had happened since Wednesday morning, and. I haven't seen any uh, updated numbers this evening on on what has happened uh, as far as throughout the day. But, uh, you know, we need to be praying for the people of Taiwan. And uh, just what a, a, a reminder that the Bible said ground's going to be shaken in the last days. And indeed it is. And we don't want to overstate these things. And, you know, one of, one of the things, and let me just pause here for a moment. Uh, you know, we got a, a eclipse that's going to move through part of the country uh, on Monday, and we've been hearing a lot of things about that. And, you know, I, I saw a guy that, you know, it, it made mention that, you know, there was uh, an eclipse on the day that Jesus was crucified. And, you know, I think we need to be careful about, you know, uh, speculating in these areas, you know, because this eclipse is going to last for five minutes. Uh, uh, the darkness was a lot longer than five minutes when Jesus was crucified. And that was not an eclipse of the supernatural darkening of the sun. So let's not read uh, something into everything that happens and find the old proverbial boogeyman behind every bush type of thing. And um, I don't see that the uh, eclipses are uh, the signs in the heavens that the Bible's talking about that are going to happen in the tribulation. I would say probably what would fit that uh, more closely is the darkening of the sun that Joel prophesied and Revelation records, uh, as well as the moon simultaneously, uh, reducing its light giving capacity and reflective capacity to the moon by a third. I think an asteroid coming from the heavens, uh, landing in the sea, destroying a third of the fish and chips uh, of the sea, and then a, a comet striking the earth and uh, poisoning the freshwater supply. Many people dying from that. I'd say those are signs in the heavens. Uh, not an eclipse that is a normal event that takes place on the earth. As a matter of fact, an eclipse is uh, evidence of God's creative power and the creation narrative of the Bible. I mean, it's no coincidence that the moon is the exact size and distance from the earth where it can completely block out the sun and only expose the sun's atmosphere around it, uh, the extended flames and all that. Um, yeah, that's just a sign that God is the one who started this whole process and uh, and completed it, by the way, in six night-day cycles, not millions of years. And, you know, we shouldn't be promoting theistic evolution. What an insult to God. He said in his word, you know, this is how I did it. I started on the first day, said, let, let there be light. And there was. And then he went through the progression of things we find in Revelation chapter 1 through 3. And then on through chapter 11, we have uh, bits and pieces uh, given to us about that. So let's just be careful about uh, trying to read something into it and creating sensationalism and these other types of things uh, that are so dominant today. Now, uh, we'll start with one of our first scratch your head um, uh, stories, if you will, that just doesn't make any sense. And I guess the the emoji that you would see or the, uh, I don't don't know what you call it, the acronym uh, SMH that you'll often find in Texas, shaking my head might be the more appropriate description. But the Jewish News Syndicate reports that the Palestinian Authority submits bid for full UN membership. Now, why is this strange? Well, because they don't have a country. Uh, there's no such country as Palestine. Uh, Gaza is located in the nation of Israel. It's not a, a separate entity, and uh, it is part of national Israel. And uh, even though Israel pulled out back in 2005, and we've seen, you know, all the turmoil since then, but you know, what a what a bizarre thing for 
you know, the UN to even accept the bid for membership. Uh, but we do know because of all of the resolutions against Israel, 14 last year against Israel, not against China, not against Cuba, uh, not against Venezuela, uh, these countries where human rights are being violated radically, and yet Israel gets the resolutions against them for your free to practice your religious beliefs. Um, you know, they have one of the largest, sadly, one of the largest gay pride parades uh, in the world there every year. And here you've got these other countries that are, are throwing uh, gay people off the roof. It's illegal. You know, there's a story that just popped this morning um, about, uh, you know, it's been discovered in the, some of the documents that uh, the IDF has recovered that in 2016, a high ranking member of Hamas was executed for being gay. And they basically uh, uh, hid the story and didn't want it to get out into the media for obvious reasons. But, you know, here we've got the folks marching around uh, saying queers for Palestine. Well, you know, I saw a meme uh, a couple days ago that said it's easier to be a queer for Palestine than a queer in Palestine. Um, and again, there's no such country. And, you know, just the, the ridiculousness of some of these things happening in the world. And I have to say, uh, all of this is in preparation for the, the earth dwellers, as the Bible calls them in the, in the book of Revelation, uh, who are Christ rejectors, uh, receiving that strong delusion that they would believe the lie. And, and uh, the world is being primed for uh, what's coming. And I think it's coming pretty soon, actually. And the Palestinian Authority submitted a request on Tuesday for the UN Security Council to vote this month on accepting the entity as a full member. In a letter to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, uh, Envoy Riyad Mansour asked that an application submitted in 2011 be reconsidered. Another supporting letter was sent to Maltese diplomat uh, uh, Vanessa Frazier, who is currently serving as a president of the 15-member council. That letter included the names of 140 countries that have recognized a Palestinian state. Well, there isn't one, again. And yet, you've got 140 countries tipping their hat to something that's non-existent. And again, this, uh, you know, uh, falls under, I guess, the stranger than fiction file. And uh, however, the United States is expected to block the bid due to Washington's longstanding policy that UN membership will only come as a result of a no, uh, negotiated bilateral, bilateral agreement uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. Our position has not changed, U.S. Deputy Ambassador Robert Wood told reporters on Tuesday as quoted by the Associated Press. And it was reported in February, however, that the Biden administration was considering a unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state, which, if true, would mark a major foreign policy shift. Mansour said on Monday that he hoped the UN Security Council will make a decision at an April 18th meeting on the Middle East. And Fraser told reporters on Monday that the council's standing committee for new members, which includes all 15 UNSC or UN Security Council members, is expected to meet privately to consider the application. And again, you know, for the U.S. to be even thinking about or for a story to leak out that uh, there was a uh, possibility of just accepting and recognizing a non-existent Palestinian state is even on the, on the table in the leadership of the United States of America and the president uh, certainly uh, is just uh, telling us that we are moving toward that Zechariah 12, 3 situation where the whole world is against Jerusalem and finds the, the Jews in Jerusalem to be a burdensome stone. And, you know, we always have to remember that, you know, the, the tribulation is the 70th week of Daniel. And uh, therefore, as Daniel was told, there are 70 heptads, there's 70 sets of seven. And we now know, looking back, that they are seven-year periods that are determined for Daniel's people and the holy city. So that would tell us what is written in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, and uh, chapter 13 and 14 of that same uh, prophetic book are related to the tribulation period and the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And we are seeing the world move in this direction. I mean, think about it, 196 countries uh, in the world, 140 of them have already recognized a non-existent Palestinian state. So, you know, we're 56 countries away from uh, seeing Zechariah fulfilled, Zechariah 12 fulfilled. And um, I think that in a sense, 
it's tragic, but in another sense, it's very exciting uh, because we could be experiencing that moment and twinkling of an eye thing very, very quickly and be in the presence of the Lord with the dead in Christ to forever be with him. Now, the Times of Israel says that Spain is going to recognize a Palestinian state by July, according to its prime minister. Well, that makes it 141. So just in the span of uh, our few minutes here on the lineup, we've gotten closer. Uh, so again, I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but I think you can appreciate the, the gravity of uh, the things that we're watching. And, and what an exciting time uh, to be alive. And, you know, of course, we're not excited that earthquakes are increasing, weather anomalies are, are frequent all over the world, happening all the time. You know, it's it's been um, here in California. Uh, we had a storm last week that um, it was just uh, unbelievable, actually. Uh, you know, it wasn't some radical sideways rain kind of thing and hurricane force winds and all of that stuff. But, you know, lived here uh, except for 18 months uh, uh, some years ago when Terry and I first got married. We lived up in the Portland, uh, Oregon area. But uh, I was born in Orange County, California, lived here my whole life except for that one time period. And, um, you know, for the first time, I think, ever uh, that I can recall anyway, I thought, man, I'm tired of this rain. It has been raining here. we got more rain coming tomorrow. <clears throat> and the little lake uh, where we go uh, walk our dog and enjoy this kind of natural uh, area. It's a beautiful little spot right in the middle of Orange County uh, where you feel like you've kind of gotten away. Uh, you know, there's picnic tables alongside the lake and the benches of them uh, were covered in water. There's no place to stand or fish or, or sit and have a lunch or, or any of those kind of things. So it's been really interesting to watch, you know, things changing and of course, you know, the climate change folks are out there uh, saying, you know, we got to we got to stop this. And uh, the only way to stop it is to pay more taxes and to redistribute the wealth as though that's going to do something to change the climate. Again, it's just what a bizarre day we live in. And all that tells us, I think the Lord's coming for us pretty soon. The Times of Israel, again, talking about this Palestinian statehood, tells us that uh, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez told journalists during a Middle East tour, according to several reports, on Tuesday that Spain is going to recognize Pal Palestinian statehood by July. In the state news agency, EFE, and uh, EFE, and uh, newspapers, El Pai, and La Vanguardia, cited Sanchez as making the informal remarks to the traveling press corps late on Monday in the Jordanian capital of Amman on the first uh, day of visits to Jordan, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. According to the report, Sanchez said he expected events to unfold in the conflict ahead of the European Parliament elections in early June and highlighted, <coughs> excuse me, highlighted ongoing debates at the UN. He expected Spain to extend recognition to the Palestinians by July, adding that he believed there would soon be a critical mass within the European Union to push several member states to adopt the same position. So there we go. Uh, you know, a, a grouping of those who will add themselves to the number of 140 and uh, Spain kind of leading the charge and all that. And again, you know, we live in just such an incredible time to watch Bible prophecy precursors to it being fulfilled and literal fulfillments of uh, certain events like the rebirth of the nation of Israel, our realities in the day in which we live. Much of the church is defected from truth. Uh, we've got groups with itching ears and just all kinds of crazy things going on in churchdom that are just dumb and uh, unbiblical at that. And Haaretz reports that Biden will make it clear to Israel that it must protect Gaza aid workers and U.S. experts, or U.S. expects a comprehensive public investigation. And what this is talking about is that uh, there were citizens from Australia, Britain, and Poland among seven people working for the World Central Kitchen who were killed in an Israeli airstrike in central Gaza on Monday. Uh, the UK has summoned the Israeli ambassador, as the UAE announced it, will halt efforts on a maritime aid route. And President Biden told World Kitchen founder, World Central Kitchen founder Jose Andres on Tuesday that he will make clear to Israel that humanitarian aid workers must be protected. Well, you know, again, Biden stating the obvious. And this was an accident. It was a tragic accident. Israel has come forward and apologized and said, you know, there was some 
bad intel, uh, you know, stating that these vehicles uh, were filled with terrorists. And, you know, that is one of the tragic parts. That's why war is hell. Uh, that's why, you know, someday we can rejoice that weapons will be beaten into plowshares and there'll be uh, no more war. And these uh, horrific and tragic events such as this will come to an end. And, you know, White House National Security spokesman John Kirby said on Tuesday that the U.S. expects the broader investigation to be conducted and to be done so in a swift and comprehensive manner. We hope that those findings will be made public and there's appropriate accountability held. And he added that the IDF must do, uh, must do much more to improve. The U.S. will continue to press Israel to do more as well to ensure the safety of humanitarian workers. And again, Israel has apologized and apologized and apologized. And uh, of course, you know, if you've lost a loved one, apology uh, doesn't carry much weight, but it is a tragic accident, miscalculation on, on their part, and uh, they've owned it and publicly stated so. And it's just uh, one of the, the horrific consequences of war. Globes is reporting that Turkey is blocking exports to Israel. And over the past five days, Turkey's government has either been delaying or not approving exports and consignments from Turkey to Israel. And Turkey's government is either delaying or not approving these uh, assignments. And agencies working with Israeli importers say that the source of the delay is the Turkish government. And it is unclear for how long the current situation will continue. Now, remember, amongst the nations under the ancient names of the from the table of nations in Genesis 10, in Ezekiel, we're, we're given a list of basically geographic locations. And under the ancient names of the descendants of Noah who settled in particular regions of the world, we can recognize that, uh, you know, Bethogarma and uh, Gomer and other nations that are named in uh, that Ezekiel war scenario are, are representative of modern day Turkey geographically. So, you know, to see uh, Turkey kind of upping the game, so to speak, uh, reminds us that there is coming this invasion from the far north uh, into Israel by uh, a coalition a set of forces that include uh, Russia. Some would argue that Russia is uh, the odd man out, not really part of the scenario, but definitely Turkey. There's no question that Turkey is involved. Uh, the Iranians are named under the ancient name uh, of Persia, and the Iranian people are Persians. Uh, they are not Arabs, they are Persians. And then you've got Libya and Sudan. And uh, these four nations are all uh, radical Islamic nations. And, you know, so you've got that ideological tie between these nations. And now Turkey taking some steps to uh, damage uh, Israel financially and, uh, you know, cutting off uh, supplies. And, you know, that reminds us that, you know, during the tribulation period, there is going to be a major food shortage. And, um, you know, the uh, 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 quart of wheat or three quarts of barley, which barley is the grain of the poor, uh, are going to cost a whole day's pay. And that's inflation like we've never seen anywhere in the world, far worse than the, um, you know, 14 or 15 percent interest rates that we saw here in the United States uh, back in the 80s. And again, you know, to see Turkey kind of uh, puffing their chest out and saying, you know, this is, uh, though this is not an official sanction, there have been signs of severe measures by Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan regarding trade between the two countries. And last January, Turkey decided to remove Israel from its list of export destination countries, effectively stopping, encouraging, and subs uh, subsidizing trade and support for businesses that operate with Israel. And this is just what's going on here in the U.S. and other countries, the BDS movement, the boycott, divest, sanction. And basically the way to describe that is don't do business with Israel or countries that do business with Israel or uh, have business interest in or investments uh, in Israel. Boycott, divest, and sanction them. In 2023, Israel imported 5.42 billion goods from Turkey, billion in goods from Turkey, down from 7 billion in 2022. And with the lira in Turkey crashing the way it has, you know, again, cut off your nose to spite your face is kind of the approach that we could uh, summarize this with uh, Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, we're not going to, uh, we're going to damage our own economy by uh, some 5.42 billion, at least if you use last, uh, last year's numbers. The Jewish News Syndicate reports that the U.S. trades barbs with Iran and Russia 
in the UNSC, the United Nations Security Council meeting, on a Damascus strike. And Tehran says it holds the U.S. accountable for Monday's deadly strike against Iran's embassy compound in Damascus. And Washington warned against any retaliation against the backdrop of a regional war. <clears throat> At Russia's request, the U.N. Uh, Security Council met on Tuesday to discuss the airstrike widely attributed to Israel that killed two Iranian generals and five military advisors. Israel, which has not claimed responsibility for Monday's blast, has long carried out airstrikes against Iran, affiliated targets in Syria, in an effort to prevent the flow of weapons to Tehran's proxies and contain the Islamic Republic's footprint in the region. But Monday's incident, especially notable for its diplomatic compound and high-value targeting, marked a significant escalation. And, you know, we do know that Damascus is going to cease from being a city and become a ruinous heap. That is a yet unfulfilled prophecy recorded in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1. But we also recognize that there's going to be something that lights the fuse of the powder keg known as the Middle East and something like this. I think that's a significant statement that this marked a significant escalation. And uh, again, something like this is going to be the trigger uh, that causes these nations to uh, be drawn down from the north and invade Israel. And uh, the Bible is very, very clear on the outcome of that invasion, and that is that they will meet their demise. And again, I've said this many times before, but I'll repeat it for those maybe joining us who haven't heard before. I believe that it is quite possible that the Ezekiel War starts before the rapture. The rapture happens during the war, and it ends after the church is gone. And uh, maybe not during the tribulation, because the rapture does a signal the beginning of the tribulation. There's obviously a, a time period where the world is trying to catch its breath from the mass disappearance of people from all over the world. But it, it seems very clear because the response that brings about the destruction of five, six of the invading armies and the destruction of their home countries, uh, homelands as well, is divine in nature, which is more consistent with uh, not the age of grace that we now live in, but the times where God is dealing directly with the nation of Israel, and he is going to defend them. And Zechariah uh, 13 goes as far to say that in that day, the Lord will fight as he fights in the day of battle. And if you want to know how the Lord fights, just read the story of the Exodus and the 10 plagues uh, that came upon Israel. And you'll find very similar, some very similar things uh, with what's going to happen with um uh, the destruction of the invading forces in the Ezekiel War scenario. Now, the reason I say that is because it should remind us that we are getting close and time is running out. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, that's a, an exciting thing to consider that one of these days we're going to get up and it's going to be that day, uh, the day where we go home to forever be with the Lord. But it should also give us a sense of desperation for those around us uh, who are perishing without Christ and and give us a boldness to uh, share the love of Christ with those, um, you know, who are perishing. And, you know, it also reminds us that we need to be, um, I think, well-equipped. As uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, that's the purpose of going to church, is to be equipped for the work of ministry. And in the days in which we live, I think we need to be equipped uh, with Bible prophecy knowledge to where we can say, you know what? Hey, the Bible said this 2,700 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And it's happening right before our eyes. So you ought to consider the Bible's gospel message as well and uh, that you must be born again. So, you know, just reminding us of these things, I think, is healthy for us. And uh, again, as I said, should cause us to, to want to reach out and tell other people, uh, not just that Jesus is coming soon, but that, uh, and, you know, one of the things that I think is kind of curious that has happened in these recent years within the church is, you know, people are, are trying to market Jesus. They're trying to make him appear as though he's something that you just you just got to have, you know. And, um, you know, I think we need to remember, we need to be telling people uh, that you need Jesus, not trying to create a Jesus that people will want, uh, one who's just, you know, cool with everything, as uh, some present him today, but that they need him. For without him, you can't be saved. And uh, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. and uh, But God has given us the gift and uh, demonstrated love in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The Jerusalem Post is reporting that preparing strikes on Israeli embassies, the coming Iranian response 
to serious strike to the serious strike, which we talked about a moment ago. Hezi Simatov, a commentator and correspondent for Arab Affairs on News 13, spoke Tuesday morning with Nassim Mashal and Anat uh, Devanov on 103 FM about the assassination of senior Iranian Mohammad Reza Zahidi, commander of the Quds Force in Syria and Lebanon, and the expected consequences. And first of all, according to the reports from Syria, Iran, the Israeli and Iran rather, the Israeli Air Force allegedly attacked a building adjacent to the Iranian embassy in Damascus, where several senior Iranian officials were located, among them Mohammad Reza Zahidi, who is actually the deputy commander of the Quds Force, and that's what the Muslims call Jerusalem, Quds, of the Revolutionary Guards in Syria and Lebanon. A very senior member of the Iranian hierarchy, he managed the entire operation of smuggling weapons from Syria to Lebanon. He was a very senior person who can can be said to have given Israel a lot of headaches in the last 20 years for all his exploits and his involvement in terrorism. This is the most senior Iranian who has been eliminated so far since the October 7th uh, event, uh, terror attack, and the most senior one uh, killed on Syrian soil. This is a severe and painful blow to the Iranian regime, a matter in which the Iranians are more inclined to take revenge against Israel. We have already eliminated several of their senior officials since October 7th on Syrian soil. This is the period when Iran wants to show that it is leading the access of resistance. And uh, Hamas is currently at a disadvantage because of fighting in Israel. This doesn't mean that the Iranians will try to do something impulsive necessarily. They will perhaps try and activate their militias in Syria or the Houthis in Yemen. And they're laying the groundwork to strike at Israel diplomatic representations worldwide in the Arab world, Europe, or the United States or South America, uh, Simentov said, and the assassination attributed to Israel certainly makes the confrontation between Iran and Israel more direct rather than indirect as it has been until now in Syria. So again, this has been a shift and, and even uh, Muslim reporters are recognizing that this is different. This is something uh, that brings about uh, you know a, a level of intensity that wasn't previously there. And, you know, one of these days, uh, much like the rapture of the church, one of these days, the Middle East powder keg is going to blow up and there's going to be an invasion into Israel. And God, again, is going to act on behalf of his chosen people. And by the way, they still are his chosen people. The church has not replaced them, nor have they been cast aside. And, you know, this uh, growing anti-Semitism around the world is rearing its head inside the church. And it's just, it's a heinous thing. It's an, it's not just unbiblical, it's anti-biblical. And the reason I say that, uh, the reasons I should say are many, but I mean, come on, think about it. If God has cast off Israel forever, then why is Jesus coming back to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem? Well, I mean, if Israel has no right to the land, that means the Muslims do. So does that mean that Jesus is coming back to Quds instead of Jerusalem? I mean, you know, these arguments are just ridiculous and they are demonic. And uh, that's exactly what replacement theology is. It's demonic. We have not replaced Israel as the church in God's redemptive plan. And, you know, uh, one of the more uh, dangerous things about taking that position, if God has cast off Israel, then the Bible contains errors. There aren't 70 weeks determined for Daniel's people in the holy city. There's only 69, and we know 69 have been fulfilled. So Daniel should have been told that there are 69 weeks if God was going to cast aside Israel and the 70th would not be fulfilled. And besides that, one of the most ridiculous elements about the church replacing Israel is then that means that not just the blessings promised to Israel apply to the church, but so do the curses. And what we can glean from that is, is that if replacement theology is true, then the church is going through the tribulation. And there's a bevy of problems with uh, that particular interpretation. So, you know, we don't blindly, you know, stand beside Israel and just accept everything they do. But what we do believe and support um, is their right to exist and their place in God's plan in these last days. And the New York Times even reports 
that fears are growing that the Syria strikes could spur retaliatory attacks on Israel and the U.S. And current and former U.S. officials expressed fears on Tuesday that Israel's airstrikes on an Iranian embassy compound in Syria could escalate hostilities in the region and prompt retaliatory strikes against Israel and its American ally. The officials said that the attack on Monday, which killed three generals in Iran's Quds Force and four other officers, had dealt a serious blow to the force and the external military and intelligence service of the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps. And Ralph Goff, a senior, a former senior CIA official who served in the Middle East, called Israel's strike incredibly reckless. You know, I just <clears throat> think about all the reckless things that are going on here in the United States. And, uh, you know, for the anybody that's got any place in the United States government, even a former official, you know, to wag their finger at Israel and say, you know, you shouldn't be doing this when you've got somebody on the northern border that seeks your destruction and they're trying to, um, you know, infiltrate Syrian territory and have a, a trade route uh, into that country where they can uh, basically covertly bring weapons in for the purpose of destroying Israel. And, um, you know, Israel striking at them uh, is incredibly reckless in this gentleman's uh, perception. It's just bizarre how the world thinks. But, you know, this is part of the, uh, the turning against the nation of Israel. You know, we, we can't just start at militarily the world being against Israel. We have to start with mentally the world being against Israel. And, you know, in the midst of all that it's and all the things that we're seeing today, it's like October 7th never even happened. And the only thing is just, you know, in some people's minds, it seems, is that, you know, Israel all of a sudden just started attacking Gaza. And, um, you know, forget the, the, the many, I think it's 500 kilometers of tunnels that have been found and the weapons hidden in people's homes and the hospitals being used as, uh, you know, command centers and all the other things that they found. And, uh, you know, violating, you know, the Geneva Convention time after time after time and, you know, setting up and shooting weapons from uh, next to schools and hospitals and all these. Nobody says anything about that. But Israel is incredibly reckless for taking out commanders of a group that is bent on their destruction. The world has lost its mind and Jesus is coming soon. Now, Breitbart says that stars, and this, this is a, 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 another interesting story, and it has a prophetic component to it, even though the story has nothing to do with that. Stars demand developers cease predatory use of AI, warning it will replace them. And there were a bunch of uh, supposed stars who were named, and I'm not even going to read their names, but more than 200 musical artists signed an open letter urging AI developers, tech firms, and digital platforms to cease the use of AI, saying that technology will end up replacing human artists if they continue. And the letter published by the trade group Artist Rights Alliance, or ARA, calls on AI developers and tech firms to stop the predatory use of AI, to steal professional artists' voices and the likenesses, violate creators' rights, and destroy the music ecosystem, according to a report by Axios. We call on all AI developers, technology company platforms, and digital music services to pledge that they will not develop or deploy AI music generation technology, content, or tools that undermine or replace the human artistry of songwriters and artists or deny us fair compensation for our work. Well, that's the bottom line. You're, you're hitting us in the wallet, and they don't want to um, uh, see that happen. But... You know, uh, let me just pause here for a moment and say what their concern is. You know, artificial intelligence or AI, uh, there are parts or, or, or certain elements within it that uh, if they employ it to do so, it can replicate someone's voice simply by listening. I think it's something like 30 minutes of someone's voice. AI can create the, an exact replica and therefore AI uh, can write songs. Hey, I can sing songs that sounds exactly like one of these artists. And, uh, I, you know, someone had already done this to Pastor Jack Hibbs and they uh, used AI to recreate his voice and, and report that he said something he never said. And if I'm not mistaken, he was asking for money. And it sounded exactly like him, but uh, wasn't him. And, you know, so we're seeing these kind of things uh, developing 
which should point our minds to what's going to happen in Revelation chapter 13, where an image is going to be made that appears to be lifelike and will speak. And, and uh, you know, here, because we live in an age where people are used to watching, many of you are watching on some kind of device. And uh, we're used to seeing things uh, that, you know, or, or watching things that, you know, with this new advanced technology and AI, we're not even going to be able to tell whether that's a real person or not. And actually, that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about uh, in at the conference on Saturday. And I've got some pictures. I wish I had grabbed some. I should have thought of that. Uh, of some of these new robots uh, or AI, I'm sorry, AI generated images that uh, are taking the position of newscasters. And I've got a group of pictures uh, in one of these slides that I'm going to use at the conference. It has three people that there is no way looking at their pictures that you would be able to tell that that's not an actual human being. And, you know, looking at, um, you know, further down the line and, and, and consistent with what's going to happen in Revelation 13, you know, they have a new AI in China has a new AI generated news reporter that can actually answer questions. I mean, obviously these things have to be pre-programmed and most of them are, you know, things that promote, you know, the communistic stance and position and thought uh, of the government, the CCP. And uh, but, you know, this is a lifelike looking uh, image and people will be watching on a device. And it'll be just like watching another, a newscaster, a real human newscaster. And uh, the article goes on to say, the artist said, we're kind of calling on our technology and digital partners to work with us to make this a reasonable marketplace and to keep the quality of music sound and not to replace human artists. ARA Executive Director Jen Jacobson told Axios. We're not thinking about legislation here, Jacobson added. The music industry has also tried the legislation route supporting bills that would protect their work from AI copyright issues. And earlier this year, Hundreds of artists reportedly signed a letter from the Human Artistry Campaign calling on Congress to sign the No AI Fraud Act. And we are headed toward a time of fraud like the world has never seen. And uh, AI, without question, is going to play a role in this image that uh, is that of the beast uh, whose deadly wound, uh, alleged deadly wound, was healed. And again, you know, thinking about just some of the bizarre things happening in the world, the Western Journal is telling us that the anti-ESG farmers are waging manure war. And actually, two people have been killed and five have been injured and the police have been splattered with manure and waste over the last several months. And for the better part, the article says, of the last 12 months, farmers in Europe have been mounting serious and heavily attended protests against the destructive and financially ruinous progressive and climate change regulations their governments have been forcing on the farming and food production industries. This is a story that the U.S. establishment media has been desperate to ignore because some of these protests have paralyzed Europe and have shown that the everyday European citizens are done with meekly sitting back as their governments destroy their livelihoods with obscene overregulation aimed at pushing the global warming religion and their environmental, social, and governance uh, plans and governance plans, and that is uh, the global warming thing is a religion. It has doctrines and and teachings and all those other things. So, uh, and these plans are commonly known as ESG. And I didn't tell you what it meant in the title uh, of the article, but I wanted to save it for this uh, this moment. But uh, ESG is environmental, social governance the government telling you what you can and cannot do. And, you know, the word social, I think, uh, should spur our minds to think about this social credit system, credit system that's developing all over the world, already in play in China. And, uh, you know, people are talking about the, the fact that, you know, if you're not a good citizen, you can be punished. And this environmental social governance is basically telling farmers what they can do. And, you know, we we've seen such ridiculous things, especially from some in the very young generation. I can't remember what the label is for the latest generation coming up, but they're protesting against farming. You know, we have to find other ways to get food other than farming. Um, it's just unbelievable, uh, the ridiculousness, because farming in their minds is the most significant. I've heard young people say this, the most significant 
uh, uh, contributor to climate change in the world, farming. It's just insane. Well, I wonder how many of them uh, didn't eat uh, in protests. But again, it's just, it's unbelievable. And the article says another massive farmer protest arose last week in Belgium, according to the AP, and the uh, near the European Union's headquarters in Brussels, where farmers sprayed liquid manure on riot police through eggs and otherwise shut the city down as they protested the destruction on their farm of their farm thanks to the stringent regulations that they have to navigate to maintain their businesses. Now, the article goes on and records uh, different events that have taken place in different countries. And, uh, you know, Europe's infuriated farmers is the subject matter. But the interesting thing about this is that they are now importing food from countries that don't have these restrictions. You know, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. You will destroy your own people and import food from other countries uh, who have no such regulations to save the world, to, to, to fight climate change. And, you know, again, it's, it's just beyond rational to see the idiotic things that are being promoted these days and protected. I mean, you don't want your own farmers raising food, but you'll buy food from another country who doesn't practice your restrictions. I mean, come on, how idiotic is that? And yet this is becoming more and more the norm. And again, I think the article hit the nose on the head that Western uh, media outlets are not reporting this uh, because they don't want it to start happening in, in the United States because people are pretty much fed up. Or many of them, I should say, are pretty much fed up with the overreach of the government that's happening uh, in our own country and the open borders and all the other things that we're experiencing. Now, the Gateway Pundit reports that four pro-life advocates have been convicted by the Biden regime for praying and singing hymns outside. Four more pro-life advocates convicted by the Biden regime for praying and singing hymns outside an abortion clinic in Tennessee. Joe Biden's Department of Justice and FBI is hunting down pro-life conservative grandmas while ignoring Antifa and BLM militants. Four pro-life Christians were convicted of violating the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances, or FACE Act, following a peaceful protest at a Tennessee abortion facility. Uh, these individuals, including a man named Paul Place, now face potential penalties of a year in prison and thousands of dollars in fines with sentencing scheduled for July 30th. The convictions were the result of a one-day bench trial overseen by Middle District of Tennessee Magistrate Judge Chip Frinsley, according to the Daily Caller. And Judge Frinsley sided with the Justice Department, affirming that the defendants had indeed breached the law. The verdict was reached after less than 30 minutes of deliberation. Following the court's decision, uh, the convicted, along with their families, gathered outside the courthouse to engage in singing and prayer, signaling their continued solidarity and faith despite the legal setback. And defense lawyers criticized the prosecution as an excessive use of federal power, particularly pointing to the Biden regime's aggressive stance against individuals expressing their beliefs in a nonviolent manner. They argued that their clients were simply engaging in prayer and worship in hopes of dissuading women from terminating their pregnancies. The charges stem from an incident on March, 4th, uh, March 5th, rather, 2021, when the defendants participated in a pro-life demonstration at the Carafem abortion facility in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. And the group, which included four, the four convicted, had gathered in the office building's second floor hallway outside Carafem, engaging in prayer, hymn singing, and attempting to dissuade women from proceeding with abortions. In October 2022, 11 pro-life advocates were arrested and indicted for federal offenses in connection with an alleged reproductive health care clinic blockade uh, on, on March 5th, 2023. So there were 11 in total arresting people for praying and singing hymns outside an abortion clinic. What is this world coming to? Well, it's coming to an end, at least is the way uh, we see it now today. And, you know, there's going to be a uh, rather interesting geopolitical restructuring after the church is gone. And uh, I, again, I believe that we are obviously uh, closer than ever before, 
But I think we have reason to live more than any generation prior to us with the expectation of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the rapture could come at any moment. Nobody knows the day or the hour. It could have happened years ago. You know, it's uh, one of those things that's without sign or indication. It's just, you know, as Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, nobody knows. His Father had the predetermined hour, and uh, that's when it's going to happen. And, you know, again, we're not saying that, you know, there's a certain date coming ahead, but, you know, there are Jews in Jerusalem now, which makes things a lot different. Uh, the church is defected from truth, which makes things a lot different. Uh, people today are lovers of self and haters of God, which makes things a lot different. The world, I mean, we just read an article, 140 nations have already signed on to a Palestinian state, which is inside of land that God gave to the Jews by unconditional eternal covenant. And the Lord, you know, uh, wrote through the prophet Amos that when the people are back in the land, they will not be uprooted and that God is going to fight for them, Zechariah said. And so we're watching all these things that previous generations didn't see. So we have to have that, that, uh, that hope and that expectation. And, but that's going to come with some other things, I believe. At least it should. It should, as I said earlier, come with a sense of desperation uh, for the lost and perishing around us. So let's get out there and tell people about Jesus, the signs that, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the things about the Olivet Discourse um, that I think often gets overlooked. Jesus said, no man, no man knows the day or the hour, but here's what you can know. And then he went into a description of things being as they were in the days of Noah. Looking back to Noah's day, the earth was filled with violence. We can check that box. Thoughts and intents of man's heart is only evil continually. We can check that box. Uh, they were people in Noah's day were buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage, which just is, uh, uh, implies an indifference to the impending signs of judgment. Noah was building a boat on dry ground on a planet where it had never rained for 120 years. I'd say that's a pretty significant sign that something is coming. And, you know, the Genesis tells us that uh, a mist went up from the ground and watered the earth. And then the heavens opened at the time of the flood for the first time, and it began to rain on the earth. So here you've got this family, eight people building this massive boat size of battleship, modern battleship on dry ground away from the sea. And, um, and you know, Peter tells us Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So, you know, he was preaching preaching that judgment was coming. And what was going on with the world? Buying and selling, marrying and giving you marriage, inventing evil things, doing all the other things we see exactly happening now. Here we are living in time where the Jews are back in Jerusalem. Uh, the church, as I said, has largely defected from truth or much of it. I should say all the character flaws of humanity are parallel to those of Noah's day. Uh, you know, good is called evil. Evil is called good. And I'll remind you that, you know, that, that statement in, in Isaiah 520 that's been quoted and quoted and quoted in recent years, especially in the uh, regarding the abortion issue, is the end of a progression of events that uh, after that, you know, Isaiah is talking about, prior to that, Isaiah is talking about the fact that this is how it's going to be at the time when the Lord rises to shake the earth. He says that twice in chapter two, and we are seeing the very things that were described in Isaiah, incompetent leadership, I'll give you children for your rulers. All these other things are happening uh, right now. So I say all that just, just to remind you, Jesus is coming soon. And, uh, you know, soon kind of has an open door to it. It's a lot sooner than it used to be. That much we know for sure. But I don't think that we're infringing upon the statement of Jesus by saying we need to be looking up because today could be the day. And uh, if not today, tomorrow will be an even more likely day that it will happen. And uh, we can tell you, the Bible tells us we can see the day approaching. And, you know, in the Olivet Discourse, the Lord says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up for your redemption is nigh in there. That applies to the Jews uh, at the end of the tribulation. But for us, you know, we can see it as it was in the days of Noah. Because that particular phrase is associated with the days before the flood, before God's global wrath. So anyway, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And please uh, keep me in prayer as I travel uh, this week. You know, uh, it's been pretty cool for California. I mean, we've had some really chilly weather, some overnights down uh, close to the 30s. I think the other day it was 41. 
uh, overnight, you know, that's cold for us. You know, we're, we're that uh, 75 degree crowd here uh, in SoCal, but I guess in uh, where I'm headed, it's going to be 30, the high is 50. And uh, so, but, you know, for those who know me, I like that kind of weather. Uh, it um, tend to run hot. <laughs> so anyway, really, please pray that uh, God move. And most of all, that people get saved. Well, that's it for this week. And I hope you, all of you Louis lovers out there got a little uh, Louis fix. And uh, and I always enjoy bringing him on. And I love the comments afterwards. So, well, that's it for this week. And uh, we'll see you here, there, or in the air. Please be praying. God bless you.